there any chance that other candidates are not going to win? That's I thought more. And we're ready whenever you are, Mayor. Okay. Good evening, and thank you for attending remotely at tonight's city council meeting. The camera in the council chambers is set up to show those attending in person. Please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge of allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Mayor Scully? Here. Councilor Dillaba? Here. Councilor Fisher? Here. Councilor Kennedy? Here. Councilor Powers? Councilor Reich? Here. Councillor Scamperly, quorum present. Michael and Dan both let us know they were not available. Yeah, to be excused. I never received a request, Mayor, for either councillor to be excused. I thought that the email said that they were not going to be able to make it tonight. Okay. Um. Our only item of business will be read by City Manager Stephen Jolly. A resolution to accept the 2022 preliminary budget and direct that the preliminary budget be filed with the City Clerk and the Comptroller of the City of Ogdensburg. Whereas, as required by the City Charter, City Manager has submitted a preliminary budget for fiscal year 2022 to the City Council on or before November 1st, 2021. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the City Council hereby accepts the preliminary budget and directs that the preliminary budget be filed with the City Clerk and City Comptroller. I'll introduce this item. I'll second it. Okay, uh, we'll start discussion with our City Manager. <clears throat> Good evening, Mayor and Council. Citizens of Ogdensburg, Tonight, uh, before you have the proposed 2022 budget, it's a document that I'm proud to tell you all is balanced and balanced in the regard that we have found a way to take the available resources to us and match those in an equitable way across the priorities for the city. We do not have the luxury of borrowing or deficit spending. So when I say balanced, we have no choice but to balance our revenue with our expenses. But what is also most important that we do is balance the functions, the priorities of the city government in a manner that allows us to move forward with all of our programs in a responsible manner. I believe the city comptroller, the department heads, and quite frankly, a good majority of all the city staff have worked hard to bring you this budget. It is full of a lot of good news from my perspective. It's full of a lot of hope for the future. It's full of a lot of things that move us in the right direction. It is not, however, without some pain, without some challenges, and without some things that we'll have to overcome in the months ahead. I do think it's important for me to know at this time that I've done my level best to bring you all the facts and the priorities as we know them throughout the entire time I've been your city manager. One of the most challenging aspects of this job is ensuring that you're given the facts and those facts are not impeded by things that are just not facts. That those facts are not impeded by opinions of the way people would like to see those facts. It is my job to provide you facts, to make sure those facts stay aligned, stay proper, and are given to everybody at the same time. And I believe that I've done that. Any talk to the contrary, from my perspective is just talk. There is at no point in time I've ever given any of you information and not afforded it to, to each of you in city council and the staff for that matter. There's no time when anyone's asked me for something that if it's been within my power or quite frankly capacity to get done, you didn't receive in a timely manner. We have a very small staff in city hall. We respond to multiple priorities on a daily basis, not the least of which in the previous year and a half has been a tenfold increase 
in the number of freedom of action, freedom of information requests. That is a responsibility for us to do. We do those in a timely manner. They will not always be immediate. We won't respond to all those overnight. We also won't always take 45 days to respond to those. Some of them require little attention. Some require a lot of attention. I want to address social media just for a second. I feel like, again, everybody else has had their say on this, so I'd like to get mine. Uh, from a perspective of messaging to the community, I find social media absolutely appropriate, and quite frankly, some people's only conduit to information. Some people don't watch the news anymore. Some people don't read the newspapers. They pay attention to social media. And a lot of information on social media that goes out from people that are considered credible in this community is sometimes just flat wrong. It's flat false. Some of it's made up. There's been some information from members of council in the past year that has gone out. Flat false, flat wrong, and quite frankly, put me in a pretty awful position at times as your fire chief responsible for public safety when people are talking about the results of fires and EMS calls in a way that's just not factual. The way I speak is the way I speak. I'm pretty plain spoken. I don't talk in fancy words. I don't make up things. And when I'm annoyed about something, generally people understand that. I have been annoyed on a couple of occasions when professionals are not acting professionally. I do bear some responsibility for comments, letting my emotions get out of hand, and honestly, sometimes just speaking to people things that I could just better keep to myself. Sticks and stones, as the old saying goes, and I need to practice that better myself, as do I hope everybody will as well. I'd like to start tonight by just highlighting some of the areas in the budget that I think are important for us to all talk about in some level of detail. You do not have a letter uh, in my proposed budget tonight. You have this presentation as my introduction. I will finalize the letter when the budget is formalized. I think this is a much better avenue for me to communicate my thoughts to you and priorities for the year. I'd like to go ahead and, and go through the bulk of these slides. At some point, we'll stop uh, at each interval if there are questions that are pertinent to be answered. I don't want to take any more of Council's time tonight uh, than absolutely necessary, so I'd like to work through my presentation. 2022 budget highlights. We have programmed another 10% tax cut. That will bring the total tax cut since 2022 to 20%. Tax rate would drop to 1588 per $1,000 of assessed value, the lowest tax rate since 2010. With this tax rate, we will reduce our constitutional tax limit to 69%. That in and of itself is the most significant reason why we must continue to reduce property taxes. Yes, returning money to residents. Yes, returning money to taxpayers that need it so badly is important. But by the city operating so close to their constitutional tax limit, you leave yourselves no ability, no room to raise money if you have to. Last year, our budget presentation left or our, our constitutional tax limit of near 81% left us just about 700,000 to raise in property taxes. This year that amount will increase and our city comptroller will talk about that in more detail. We're gonna experience what we think will be about a 20% decrease in our sales tax revenue. This is based on the predictions and the projections we're making and preempting and collecting our own sales tax. I'll speak more again in the presentation about how we got there and why we are there. It is important to note, this will account for a $765,000 shortfall in the amount differences that we budgeted in sales tax from last year to this year. The amount that we expect to receive this year in sales tax is significantly more than that, and our shortfall in that amount will be over a million dollars. We have avoided about 11% uh, increase this year in funding coming from the water and sewer funds into the general fund. You've heard me talk about this on many occasions. We have to reduce the dependency on subsidizing the general fund from the water and sewer fund. We have to accept that you're a board of directors and I am the CEO of three different corporations. 
and one of those corporations, two of those corporations can't continue to subsidize one that is bleeding money. We have robbed those two accounts for so long that we are now borrowing millions, $30 million plus to repair our wastewater treatment plant and another 10 to $20 million on the horizon to fix our water treatment plant. And that is unacceptable. 13% reduction in our overall debt of significant importance to continue to do that, pay our bills. There will be staffing reductions this year. I am not happy that we have to reduce staff in any of our departments. We have no department in the city that is overstaffed, not one. Not one single area of our city is overstaffed. In fact, for our current workload, we're all fairly significantly understaffed. But we have to manage with the resources that we have. I am happy that we'll reach those reductions this year through vacant positions. This budget calls for no layoffs. It, would, it will mean seven positions reduced from the police department, three from the fire department, one from the DPW, and one from the city staff. There are hard choices to be made in this budget. There are hard decisions to accept, but there are realities about the money that we have. There is no secret fund. There is no money buried anywhere. We have to live within the means that we have. We maintain a strong fund balance. Our fund balance now sits just over $4 million. My budget will call for us to maintain at least $2.5 million. That keeps us within the state's recommended 15 to 20% uh, fund balance. We will stay within that, but I will recommend a portion of that fund balance over that amount be used to, for the first time in many years, begin to address capital projects and capital priorities of the city. Strengthening our commitment to the planning and economic development programs, no time greater than now, that we must look to invest in the future of our city, we must look to invest in the planning of our city, and we must make sure that we are able to match the commitment of the private sector in moving projects forward. I spoke on a number of occasions about the pay disparity between city departments. I am not comfortable as your city manager with the adage of everyone got a fair chance to negotiate their contracts, I don't believe that was true. I believe that some unions negotiated before an election, some negotiated after. It resulted in a deep divide and a further pay disparity. We cannot have a 30% pay gap between our lowest paid employees and our highest paid employees at the relatively same technician level. And we cannot have the lowest paid employees paying 12 to 14% more in healthcare contributions. It just simply is not fair, it's irresponsible, and it's unacceptable. We will provide funds for the citywide reassessment project, been talked about for many years. We have to do it. We can't put it off. Property values are on the rise in Ogdensburg now. We are no longer flat. We have to do this. Doing it by neighborhood will only cause a disparity and that we won't be able to adjust the tax rate for the entire city if we do that. We'll have some residents paying significantly more than others just based on timing of the assessment. That just will not work. Providing funds for the design of the new skate park. Again, a topic that uh, we'll talk about under recreation, but I, I will say again, a lot of hoopla, a lot of people involved, a lot of emotion, but I'm not seeing much action. I'm not seeing much input from the counselors that were the loudest and the most concerned about it and coming to the table and helping us find a location. I hope that will change. As city manager, I saw a problem that had been going on for years. I'm a decisive leader. I don't stay in the middle very long. Numerous complaints on a daily basis, including from members of council, about behavior and conduct, and quite frankly, just the mismatch of venue. Skate park with teenagers, that want to be loud and proud and say what they want to say versus people that are playing tennis and want a quiet, calm environment. Complete mismatch has been that way for years. Everybody has known that. I was not going to sit by for one more year and see us talk about doing something and not. So we moved it temporarily. In my opinion, it's moved temporarily. If that location ends up being the decision of council where it goes, so be it. But it's temporarily moved and we fixed 
the compatibility issue at the courts. I think we have one group of people now very happy, and I hope that we will move swiftly to make the other group of people very happy. This budget balances funds over all departments and programs, as I said earlier. We cannot continue to remain 50 plus percent, 60 percent, it's sometimes moving up on 70 percent of our budget going in one direction in one program. Public safety is important. Nobody argues it. Nobody challenges it. Nobody really questions it. It's a question of how do we keep this city moving forward on all programs in all directions. We will not police our way out of the crime problem we have in the city. We won't do it. The police are the band-aid. The police are the stopgap. We have got to get this community developed. We have got to return all homes and all neighborhoods to viable places that working families want to come to and live and move the drugs out of the communities. Move the opportunity for low income, <clears throat> excuse me, drug lords and drug dealers that want to pay low rents. We have to stop that. Augsburg has, has places for low income families to live and to move safely. We've got to remove these stains in our communities and through active code enforcement, in partnership with law enforcement, in partnership with public health officials, in, public, in partnership with other public safety officials, we are moving to start cleaning up these drug problems. We will continue to do that. These are the highlights of the things we'll discuss this evening. I'd like to ask Angela Gray to come to the podium now just to speak to you about our tax levy, our tax rate, the history, and talk about the very important topic that I think is very, very misunderstood because most communities don't have to talk about this, and that is the relationship of our tax rate to our constitutional tax limit. Angela? Good evening, Councillor Mayors. Uh, this year, as Steve has mentioned, um, we did propose in the budget a 10% tax cut of property taxes. This will bring our tax rate to $15.88 per 1,000. In terms of dollars, this is a reduction of revenue of about $555,000 throughout the city. Um, so turning to the slide on the constitutional tax limit, there is a strong reason that the city of Augensburg has to consider this tax decrease. Um, in 2018, you guys were approaching 90% of your constitutional tax limit. Most cities that fail <clears throat> are in this range and that's well documented. 2019, you are 87%, same with 2020. After the 10% tax cut last year, you're on the brink of the danger zone at 80%. This year's tax cut brings you into a much more favorable level of 69.44%. The state comptroller has limited, or statutorily set the amount of tax that any municipality can assess and it's based on a five-year average of real property times a percentage you do get certain exclusions in that um, but once you hit the top limit of that where you're very close to in 2018 which is just a few years ago it really wasn't that long ago um, that is your top revenue source in the city and you had a limit very close to approaching you can't do anymore so now that we're down below that at 69.44 percent um, you have the ability right now to raise taxes about 1.7 million dollars so you've given yourself quite a bit of room for future should the city have to raise taxes in the future that same number last year after your tax cut was around eight hundred and fifty thousand dollars so a significant change this year um, next to the chart showing your historical constitutional tax limit are various cities that we track statistics to just more so for information um, all but the city of Watertown and that's only listed because of its proximity to Ogdensburg are around the same population of around 10,000 citizens the constitutional tax limit in all of those uh, you can see varies from the village of Messina being the highest, but only by two percentage points, um, higher than Ogdensburg last year. And the city of Canandaigua being the lowest at 39%. Also of interest is the tax rates in each one of these cities. They also range from approximately $9 um, to Ogdensburg being the highest last year at 17.87. So um, there is 
it's hard to take that much money out of a budget. I fully understand that, um, but I encourage that the council consider a tax cut for this year just to give you, put you back in a safe space for your constitutional tax limit and give you some room in the future. Your three largest revenue sources in the city, um, just to go through that, are your property taxes currently budgeted for about $4.5 million. Your sales tax, we've budgeted $2.9 million, another reduction that was anticipated. And also your aid from New York State is $1.7 million. If the city hits the constitutional tax limit, the state will start to withhold um, local assistance payments. So that is the biggest reason not to do it. That is your third largest revenue source at this point in time. And just going forward, um, where are your property tax dollars go? So citywide, we have a budget of approximately $18 million between general fund, water fund, and the sewer fund. The general fund's total budget is $12.9 million. The sewer fund is $2.3 million and the water fund is $2.6 million. When we look at this chart that's showing where your property taxes go, the police and fire are 50% of the general fund budget. There's been significant efforts on the past two budgets to reduce those expenses <coughs> and to, as uh, city manager had said, spread the dollars out between all the other departments. Public works is currently 20% of that budget and our other general government services is, is an additional 17%. 5% going to parks and recs and another 4% between code, animal control, and OVRS. And that pie chart is 2022? Yes, it is. It's based, based on, on the 2022 proposed. budget, yes. Based on what's proposed. Then another matter of, in, of to note uh, is the debt outstanding in the city. I've given you five years of total debt principal, which includes your bond anticipation notes outstanding at the end of the year, your bonds, and your leases. So there was some equipment leases in the city that we also consider um, long-term debt. We start in 2018 with $4.8 million in debt, and we anticipate to end in 2022 with $3.8 million of debt, not to include any new debt on the sewer system. So I just wanna make that clear. These are existing um, bans and bonds that we have outstanding. In 2021, we've been successful in paying off the two last leases. So those will fall off the year and have already been paid actually. So that's where we think we'll be sitting is about $4 million of debt at the end of 2022, outside of water, or sorry, the sewer. Um, so older one, older bonds for water and sewer are in here or no? They are, yes. The only ones that are not in there is the new project that's coming okay. on board. Okay, thank you. That's expected to close uh, with a principal payment due in June of this coming 22. We've been working with our bond council to anticipate what that payment will be. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it's going to be a lot. <laughs> it will be a seven digit number. Yes. Any questions? I think this is, I think. This is great work. I want to follow up on just a couple of things on the on the tax rate. Again, I, I this is a topic we spent a lot of time, and I think uh, as we post this presentation on the city website encourage everyone to look at this. If you don't understand what we talk about, about the constitutional tax limit and the ceiling of money, please, please ask and we'll provide further explanation. This, this in essence is the only money that council controls. This is it, property taxes. It's the only money you really control. Sales tax, state aid, grants, you don't control any of those things. If you have to raise money, if you have to make a decision to spend money, if there's a crisis in this city, the only place you have to raise money ultimately, other than borrowing it, is from property taxes. So again, I've said this a bunch of times, a lot of people cough, but the most significant reason to lower property taxes is because at some point in time, you will need to raise property taxes. And we do not have the ability to raise property taxes very far. Less than seven digits is not worth talking about in this environment. It's not. When the average firefighter is now costing us 140,000, the average police officer 120, and the average DPW worker 80, 
it doesn't take long for us to rack up significant amounts of money. I do expect we will get the letter. Uh, Angela indicated the numbers on here are tax limit. I wanna make sure everybody on council again is clear. This is the percentage based also on us using our exclusions. Without those exclusions, our numbers are much higher. It's almost mind boggling why the state would have such a program that they allow exclusions to reduce this debt amount so that you can take on more. If you look at where these other communities are, the exclusions don't really matter because they're nowhere near it. So giving a community like ours exclusions in which to be able to use more money is really the equivalent of somebody with maxed out credit cards being given a little bit more. The idea from the state is use that money wisely to get things under control, you must have a crisis. So our numbers actually are higher. I do expect this year we will get the letter again from the state because last year with exclusions, we were around 81% of our constitutional tax limit, an improvement from the previous year, but still fairly high. And when you take off the exclusions, we likely were closer to 90%. Where property, I'm sorry, John. The exclusions are primarily like the $43 million wastewater treatment plant project. No, sir, in, in general, they're not, uh, right, Angel? The large, so it would be a large, it would be large debt. So we have, we have debt now from our previous uh, uh, capital projects there, and then some of our annual debt is considered a capital project, and we can use that. So you're right, once we, if, once we finance that 30 or $40 million, that could be looked at as an exclusion. And so now we've got that big debt payment, but the ability to raise taxes all the farther. Where's the money coming from? Your taxpayers and your ratepayers in general are the same people. Which is why the Environmental Facilities Corporation should have provided about $10 million more in grant money for the wastewater treatment plant project. 50%, mm -hmm. um, less than 50% when uh, other communities have gotten more than 50%. And given our economic condition in general, they should have provided additional grant money. Agree, and we'll talk uh, more, Councilor Reich, about uh, our partnership uh, with our state representatives and our state government. Where your property tax dollars go, we've improved that this year. We were much closer to 60% last year. We've got that down now, uh, around 50% with our major public safety programs. Again, I want to emphasize here, I don't care what the fodder is. I don't care what the crap talk is. I'm a career fire chief. Spent my entire life with the fire department. I'm not anti-fire department. We have to have a city to have a fire department. We have to have a city with viable funds to have a viable fire department. The direction we were going in without a viable city meant we weren't gonna have any fire department. The can has been kicked down the road for years. All the tricks have been played. Every bit of money has been taken, funds taken from one fund to move to another, raising taxes as high as they could, and looking for grants to cover costs that we had no intention of ever being able to cover ourselves. Those days have to be over. We are in the period of reckoning. 10, 15, 20 years of kicking the can down the road has finally brought someone to the point that we have to take action. This is not about wanting less police. This is not about wanting less firefighters. This is about wanting our city to remain viable. I'm going to move to the workforce strength slide. I just wanted to be again completely candid and transparent about this. There have been significant reductions in the workforce uh, in the last two years. But I wanted you to see in 2018, 2019, and 2020 years that this council had been, been being told you're in trouble. You're at your constitutional tax limit. You can't raise enough money to keep your city going. Look at the changes in personnel we made. Almost none. No hard decisions were made. We can't cut enough pens and pencils. We can't remove enough paper, and we can't take enough supplemental money away from our grant programs, matching money, to cover these costs. The personnel costs are the highest, $140,000 $140,000 on average now for a firefighter, $120 for a police officer, $80 for a DPW worker. 
It isn't that anybody isn't do this money. It isn't that anybody isn't worth this money. It is just a matter of we only can afford so much. We have made the decisions now. We've made the personnel cuts. I am pleased that this year's budget, we're able to make the additional personnel cuts we had to make to balance the budget and provide money to the critical programs for the future without laying off a single employee. The next slide. This is one that's been bantered and debated. I'll speak tonight on it and then I'll leave it. This is the cost for your health care in your retirement. If anybody can subtract these numbers and find $500,000 in saving, please show the comptroller and I how we do that. I don't see it. We've saved 100 here, 100 there, 50 there. Our most recent savings in health care comes from the reduced number of employees that we have. Health care is still costing the city well over $2 million. I continue to hear the stories told. I suppose that it makes sense to, for a narrative, but there is no fact that we ever saved a half a million dollars anywhere. The facts are we were on a self-pay insurance program and we had no money. We had no money to pay the claims. And worse than that, we had no insurance to stop the loss of significant claims. We were in a bad situation. Make no mistake about it. Buying insurance was the best move we had, but it wasn't a great move. It is a fixed cost that we'll pay year in and year out. I'm happy to discuss tonight that Angela Gray and I have been working with the insurance company virtually every week for the last six months. There will be no increase in the city's insurance premiums this year. There will be a decrease in the retiree insurance policy premium. That's the good news. The bad news is these are private corporations. They will make their money back in any bit they lose in future years. This is the second year we've been able to hold uh, the line there. I'm happy that we're able to do it. I think it was good progress. One of the most significant reasons that we had progress is that a year ago, our claim to premium ratio stayed below 70%. So the insurance company was able to not increase but that certainly could change in any given year. Buying insurance is expensive. Hiring a company to do that is expensive. A self-pay program is the most efficient program, but you have to have money to pay your claims. You have to have the insurance to stop loss on significant uh, claim events that happen to people. We have to put ourselves in a position in the next year to look at going back to that sort of program to be able to control our cost to the degree possible. Healthcare isn't getting any cheaper anytime soon. But being able to save $250,000 or $300,000 or a half million dollars at any given point, we have to be able to look at that. Again, moving to insurance was the smart move at the time we did it for the situation that we had. But we, we have to be able to look at our financial stability and being able to return to a self pay program as the county and most other government entities. And has the county has the county ever explored opening up that self insurance for municipalities to benefit all municipalities and and group people together to save money? It's on our list, uh, Councilor Rich, and I'll talk about that in the government initiative section. It's on our list, a request that we've made. I believe there are a couple townships uh, that they offer that up to now, and it's one of the issues or one of the initiatives that I sent the county administrator. And we have not heard anything back on yet as far as us being able to participate uh, with, with their self-pay program. Now, our insurance company is also leaning forward uh, for us in looking at other organizations that we could potentially join, part of their larger self-pay programs, and, and joining larger groups. We've got a really great firm that's working uh, for us now. Uh, our representative, uh, Zachary Zuckerman, does a great job for us. And we will be working this year. 2022 will be the year that we have to do an in-depth review on the health care and determine what is the best path going forward for the city because at twenty eight thousand dollars for a family coverage it is pretty steep cost and when i talk about the average cost of an employee that is where a large chunk of that average cost comes from is adding that twenty eight thousand dollars to the salaries the retirement cost slide i put there just as the uh is the illustration 
of the of the amount of money that the city contributes towards the retirement programs it's not insignificant again it's down a little bit this year because of the lesser number of employees the uh the state prior to the 2018 financial crisis 2008 financial crisis um i don't think employees or municipalities were contributing to the fund because it was such a healthy fund. And I would assume that it's gotten better since 2008 um, when they basically started making municipalities pay and employees pay. It would be nice if, uh, you know, if the fund is doing that much better that, uh, you know, something like that be considered. We might want to express that. Absolutely. The next couple slides, I want to I want to review a council, and I want to say up front: if you bring five fire chiefs in the room, five fire chief, five police chiefs, you'll you can get varying opinions all day. What I put in front of you, or what I think are the appropriate levels of staffing that council should be looking at for the police department and the fire department. Um, We'll start with the police department. I think a number of 26 is somewhere in what I would call an enhanced premium level of service for a city our size. Certainly at any time we could use 30 or we could use 50. Now there's some days we could use 100. Number 22 provides us uh, an optimal situation in which to manage programs, critical programs, but there is degradation of service in which the city has become accustomed to. A number of total of 16 people in the police department is certainly getting the essential services done, but understanding there will be things we won't be able to do, we certainly won't do as well, and we won't be as responsive. The numbers that I show you there don't include numbers if we support programs like the school resource officer, which is in the budget, <coughs> airport security at the Augsburg Bridge and Port Authority, and there is funding in the budget this year, uh, grant funding to fund the two dispatcher positions as we continue to work on the transition of dispatch with St. Lawrence County. Next slide to the fire department, similar. An optimal enhanced uh, number of 26 personnel overall, 22 is efficient and anywhere around 17 is just providing the essential services and certainly does not give us significant amounts of staff to do multiple emergencies and significant crisis without help. I give you the slide as the recognition from me that again i understand the amounts of staffing we should have i understand what the staffing level should look like in a perfect scenario i understand what the staffing levels would look like if we had more resources i also am fully aware of the workload that is on our police department and our fire department i am aware of the stress uh, that goes on in both organizations but again, I submit to the council and I submit to the community. There is nobody sitting here that wants to see less of these resources. Look at the budget. Tell me where you make the cuts. If you want more firefighters, you need $140,000 for every one you want to add. Tell me what I'm cutting. If you want more police officers, you need $120,000 for every police officer. Tell me what we're not going to do. Those are where our choices are. It's expensive service. There's a reason why there are almost no career fire department personnel in St. Lawrence County, but the city of Augensburg. There's a reason why we have a larger police department, but there's a reason why most places don't. It, they're very expensive, costly services to provide. No one needs to lecture anybody in this room about the value of the police department. There's a retired fire chief standing at the podium. There's a retired police officer sitting in the dais. Nobody needs to lecture us about what we do or forgetting where we came from or not being part of a brotherhood or some code that says all for public safety, no matter what. There has to be a recognition that we have to keep moving this city forward. Our streets, our water lines, our sewer lines, our ability to bring new business, keep business, and attract people to, to this city has to have the same level of priority. We'll always need more police officers if we don't improve the conditions economically and job-wise 
in our community. If we do that, we won't have a significant need for the police department. Our city on average sees four to five significant fires a year. And when I say significant, I mean fires of significant nature involving structures. We don't see mass conflagrations. We don't see multiple houses burning down one street at a time. We do see some fires. We're an old city with old buildings. Things happen. We're a city with a lot of criminal activity in houses. Things happen. We have outstanding mutual aid support from the communities on the outside. We do not abuse that. We respond whenever they call for fire support, as do they to us. There are times we cannot support them. There are times our partners cannot support us. But we do our level best with the resources we have. And for the most part, we've really enhanced the fire relationship. We have the benefit of a state police barracks right here in Augsburg. So we have resources from the state police close by on a lot of occasions, but recognize covering a large county. Sheriff's department with only a few more resources than we have covering, a, covering the entire county. It is time. It is time that the county, the city, the towns and the villages start to look at how we better use these resources. How we better combine and have a local law enforcement service that supplements the county service or the county service be the local system that supplements the New York State Police. Right now, we all pay three times for law enforcement. We pay it to the state, we pay it to the county, and when there's a shortfall in that service, we pay it here in the city. It's not affordable. We can't keep doing it. Again, I put these numbers out as guides. These are not be all end alls. These are my recognition, my identification analysis after being in the city about a year and a half of what I think staffing numbers ought to look like under really good times, times not so good, and times like we're in now when we've got to tighten up, dig in, work hard with the resources we have, and move forward to better times. Your, uh, your comments about the three layers of police protection. Um, it sounds like a local government efficiency grant opportunity. It's high time, Councilor Reich. Uh, the parochialism in this area is bankrupting all of our communities. The desire to have our own this, our own that, our own control this, control that is bankrupting our communities. It, it is time. There's no better model right now than to look at law enforcement as a way to figure out how can we do law enforcement more efficiently, more economically, and make the best use of the resources we have. I'm not saying our, our law enforcement agencies local don't do a good job. There's a lot of redundancy. We pay a lot of police chiefs. We pay a lot of seconds in command. We have a lot of different policies. There's one very minor but illustrative example. There were seven to eight different police reform studies done in this county this year. We should have done one. We should have had one local reform effort, so we all had the same policies, the same philosophies, the same practices going in. Instead, we all use different time, different resources, different people, and ultimately different results. I'm not saying they weren't all good studies. I'm saying we did something six, seven, eight times that we could have done once. And if we had one local law enforcement entity, it would be much better and much more efficient, in my opinion, to be able to, to prioritize and use resources instead of one small community having to take up. I had a great meeting with the sheriff. We discussed a lot of topics, but one of the things that he said to me that was striking was for years, for years, we've been bringing criminals to the psychiatric center, to the hospitals, and then they don't leave Augensburg. We move them from one, one town and they go to Augensburg, and that's where they stay. The number of mental health pickup orders and calls that are generated by these facilities, a state-run facility that fall to the Augensburg Police Department is off the chart and more ridiculous than I can even care to explain right now. The acting police chief and I are working on that. We've met once with the director of the facility. We're gonna meet again. The city of Augensburg cannot meet all the demands of the, of the psychiatric center, a state facility, cannot do it. We are going to make change there. We're gonna take some of the pressure off our people. We don't have the resources to respond to all the calls. 
and still be able to, to provide viable protection to the rest of the city. And quite frankly, it is those type of calls that are just wearing our people down. That's what's wearing our people down. Moving on to economic development priorities, I'd like to just again, make sure that I emphasize appropriately tonight. This is an area that we've talked the talk for a lot of years. We've talked it. Andrea's got more plans and more studies and more things on the shelf than I care to read in her office most of the time. We have to be prepared to put money behind these. We can't ask her to find the project, develop it, come up with a way to improve things, and then tell her to go raise her own money to do it. We've got to be prepared to invest city money in city projects. I can't keep telling her to go find a grant when she does, then tell her to go find the money from someone else for the matching funds. It makes no sense. We've got to have funds, we've got to have money available to move things forward. Diamond National Property. It's been sitting there. It's been sitting there and sitting there. It's been ready for years to be developed. This didn't happen yesterday. It didn't happen at the start of 2020. It's been sitting there for a while ready to go. We've not been ready to go. We waited for a grant to start marketing the property. What's wrong with us? It's been sitting there. We've let that Augsbury property sit there for 40 years. We really thought the Kiwanis Club was going to raise enough money to be able to clean that property, restore it, and use it for something. Kicking the can down the road. Our waterfront has been sitting there. We've got to move forward. We've got to knock down buildings like the cheese plant. We've got to knock down buildings like 212 Ford Street. We've got to knock down the old fire burned out shell houses. We've got to move forward on our own. We're not going to get rescued by the state of New York on every priority. Not going to happen. Federal government's not going to do it. They're going to provide money for some projects. We're going to get our best project. We're going to get our most important project, and they're going to move on to the next town. They're not going to keep looking at Augensburg like it's their job to bail us out. Now, I agree with Council Reich that the federal government and the state government need to be heavier in projects like the wastewater treatment plant that we're never going to be able to afford on our own. But the federal government's not going to do that as long as everybody's building a wastewater treatment plant. They have enough money to go around here as a state. Another area of parochialism. Everyone's going to have their own treatment plant. We convinced Hubleton to move into ours. That's a great move. I think, I think the, the town of Lisbon is looking at not consolidating with us. Again, they'll be looking for the state and federal funds to do that. We can't keep doing this. We'll never be able to afford to upgrade these things on our own. We've got to drop the parochialism, but we've got to be prepared to take care of our own priorities on our own. It's very difficult to apply for the type of grant money that Councilor Reese is talking about and ask for more when likely they look at our records and they realize we spent the money doing other things. How much money did we spend funding things that had nothing to do with water and sewer? Sarah Purdy, my predecessor, that a lot of people in this town think is a thousand times smarter than me, and she probably is, told this council on more than one occasion, stop doing it. And you can't fund police and fire retirements out of this because it's costly and the city couldn't afford to do it. So there are many reasons, and we have to look internal at ours first. At why are we not getting the money? Why is the money not being sent to us that we want? If we're squandering the money that we get for this, no one is going to bail us out. Waterfront development, I, I hope there's no argument amongst anybody. This is the key to transitioning this city and reviving it. That is the key. We're not going to develop the inner city. Quit waiting for somebody to come build a factory here in the industrial park. It's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. It's too, too costly to do business in this state. We don't control the state policies on taxes. We don't control the ridiculous policies on energy. The state does. They're making it impossible for business to want to come here. We've got to look to tourism. We have the greatest river in the country running through our city. There's no reason why our waterfront is not first class and developed already. We have to do that. That has to be our priority. When the waterfront develops and the waterfront revives, the rest of the city will be right along behind it. Won't be any stopping. Modernization of zoning uh, ordinance and code enforcement policies. I've heard so many times that we've been working on that. Who's working on it? What do you mean you're working on it? I don't know what that even means. We're working on it now. But I don't know if it's been worked on. When are we going to open the doors for business? We've got to do that now. We're doing it. 
I've consolidated all the entities that have anything to do with development, anything to do with code enforcement, anything to do with growth under Andrea Smith's direction. That way there's no disconnect. The city assessor works for her, the code enforcement people work for her, the planning people work for her, the engineering people work for her. Everybody who's got something to do with making this city a better place to live for the future is now working for one leader. And I promise you, there is nobody on our staff more committed to the future development of the city than Andrew Smith. Recreation priorities. There again. Can you just talk about a uh, grant agency partnership? Well, I think I did, Councillor, but oh, I, I can cap back. I, I think, again, we there is an expectation, uh, and, and Andrew has briefed on many occasions the, the dollar amount that we have out there in grants at any given moment. But I tell you, one of the difficulties that I see, again, with the grants is we can apply for 20 grants. Councilor Reese, that's something you advocate. We can do it. The danger is at some point I get 10 of those grants, or 15, or 20, and then I need $2 million in matching funds to pay the match for all of them. So, well, you're not paying for the 80% or 90%. No, yeah. I'm just making the point we have to have the money. Yeah. That's the money. Yes. We have a $1.8 million project in our main sewage lift station. Andrea Stone, first time out, the new amount from the uh, Northern Border Regional Commission, a million dollars. We got it. Bam. Didn't even question. Got that million bucks. Got to find 800,000 more. A million bucks. That's a huge grant. Got over 50% of the funding. But got to find 800. Or we got a plan to fund it. We don't have the money in the sewer capital fund because we, really, we don't have a capital fund in the sewer fund. And if we did, it would all be being consumed right now in the wastewater treatment plant. But I, I think, I Councilor, the, the further in there, though, we have, we have more to do, more we can do, more we can work with them. But as I said earlier, one of my concerns with working with those entities is they've got to see that we're doing for ourselves. And this budget and this plan that Council has put us on shows that the city is doing for itself. One of the greatest presentations we've done since I've been here is two weeks ago, Andrew and I and the mayor did the present presentation for the DRA, the Downtown Revitalization Initiative Grant. $10 million this year could potentially be 20. Holy God, $20 million that can go towards assisting with public and private partnership projects. Our entire pitch in that presentation was, we're not looking for this money to seed us. We're not looking for this money to dig us out of the hole, and we're not looking for this money to replace us helping ourselves. Those projects are all in motion, public and private. And all the money in the private partnership projects is local money. It's all people from Ogdensburg. There's nobody from California, from Chicago or Florida. It's all people from Ogdensburg investing in Ogdensburg. Good. Good. So I hope that was something that will make that grant entity pay attention and award us 10 or $20 million. Um, no. When I saw grant agency partnership, I was, uh, you know, thinking about community development block grants, and um, we should have a concerted effort on those. And if we need to appropriate some money to, to put into Andrea's budget for her use with the consultant, whatever it needs to get done, I, that's something I'm interested in. It's there, uh, Councilor. I think you'll see it for Great. sure. And I'm, and I'm glad. I'm glad to know that you're supporting those things. Because we'll be we'll be back to you again. Our recreation priorities, again, I want to tell council at this time, the direct supervision from a department head is, is coming from Andrea Smith to our program director, Mackenzie Cole. She's doing a great job recovering the recreation programs after the very difficult year through the COVID. Heard a lot of talk, heard a lot of bluster about recreation programs. The city council killed the programs. The city manager helped them do it. We were in COVID. There wasn't any recreation programs, and we couldn't keep paying for things that we couldn't do. Made the difficult decision of, of shutting it down, sending the employees home. Uh, it was difficult. Certainly didn't look uh, great in the community. Didn't inspire the confidence we wanted to in a period that was pretty tough. But the very second we were able to start doing those programs, we hired somebody. We've got the programs going back in the right direction. And we'll be bringing counsel uh, the first of the year with the appointments, the names to reestablish the Recreation Commission. There was never any intent to not do that. It just didn't make a lot of sense to have a commission doing something when there wasn't anything going on. I think that will be a viable group, uh, a diverse group of people that will help advise the program director and the department head on the recreation priorities going forward and provide us a good diverse voice coming from the community. We talked about the skate park earlier, but I'd like to just make sure we emphasize again, staff has done the work. We brought the sites to the council. We're looking for the input to narrow it down. I don't want to continue to get into a situation 
where the staff brings an idea and the council finds a reason to shoot it down. Tell us where you want this thing. We'll help wire it down. When you get us in the range of where you want it, we'll pro and con the sites for you. We'll bring you the cost. We need to do that if we're gonna make an impact on that. The Ready Project, uh, this is a, a significant opportunity and a significant amount of money coming from the state government to provide uh, greater resilience to our shoreline. Unfortunately, in the time since this project was incepted to the time that we were getting to, to the street, costs have risen significantly in construction. Availability of materials is making the price for a lot of those things very difficult. So what was a fairly small amount of matching money, about $450,000, $60,000 on an $8 million project, is now triple that potentially to the city. However, as we continue to refine these projects and bring them to council, this is another area where we really have to look at what is best for the long term. We are getting $8 million in money from the state government. What do we have to contribute? What is it worth us to do? We could never fund this project on our own. We never would fund it on our own. And I want to keep looking at that. It'll also be the gateway for improving the facilities in Morissette Park that we all know we want. I think we were all more hopeful that some of the money would have gone to improving those facilities and building new ones, but likely again, it will not. But the good news is we'll have a park that is ready and resilient for future flooding uh, disasters, and we will find the money to build the new facilities that we want. We've had public input sessions. We've talked to, to council numerous times. We now are moving forward with getting the bids in and getting the costs in so we can have a roll up the sleeve session with council and figure out can we do it? How do we do it? When do we do it? Some of you saw the recent Ready project that was completed uh, over in the Fort property. It's a, it's a beautiful project. Uh, the money went to really good use, and I look forward to us having the same uh, type of quality project for ours. I think there's no amount of concern that is too much, no amount of emphasis too great for the recreation programs and the things that we want to provide for the youth and the middle-aged and the senior-aged in our community. I think all groups are important. I think getting the commission back together will help us identify each of the appropriate demographics and find out what is wanted, what is needed, and what we can do immediately and what we've got a plan for. One of the projects in our DRI is a, is a regional recreation facility, uh, but ultimately it's, it hits the idea that we're gonna provide a greater amount of recreation to the area. And I, again, I, I ask that everyone understand those programs and facilities cost money also. If we don't harness some of the money out of the budget that has been going to public safety programs and continue starving these recreation programs, we aren't going to have them. Moving on to government priority initiatives. This is where I wanted to, to speak a little bit at each level of government. Sales tax home rule legislation and how I'll start out with this and the next one sort of together, the uh, St. Lawrence County Shared Services. We have to improve our relationship and our ability to be taken seriously by the county. If any of you sitting here or sitting in the community think that this council started the bad relationship with the county, you're just playing to a narrative. It's not true. County's been bullying us around for years, getting what they want out of us for years. Hell, they've had us doing some of their services for free, like collecting their property tax. And we might be the only government entity in the North Country that makes the superior government whole on property taxes. They make every other entity whole in St. Lawrence County. Every other town and village they make whole. Somehow, Augensburg has been making them whole. Now, I don't know whose idea that was. I don't know whose idea it was to condone it, but this council has stopped it in its tracks. Effective the first of this year, we will no longer collect their tax. We'll no longer be doing their work for no cost while they continue to try to take more and more money from the city. 
find more and more ways to take money from city residents. This is an Ogdensburg issue. I heard a council in the debate say Ogdensburg shows up. Folks showing up isn't nearly good enough on this topic. Not nearly good enough. And quite frankly, I didn't see everybody on this diet show up for those fights. And I didn't see very many people in this city show up for those fights. You want to fight with somebody? Don't fight with your neighbor. Don't fight with your city manager. And stop fighting with your city councilors. Tell us who you need to be fighting. People like Joe Lightfoot and Kevin Akers are taking our money. Money that belongs and is earned in this city, and they're taking it. And they started taking it from the previous council and the previous manager. She's the first city manager to go to the county and get bullied by those people and told, we're taking your money. This council and city manager showed up and said, no, no, you're not. And no, we're not giving in to you, but we'll negotiate because maybe you're right. Maybe this formula hasn't been looked at in a number of years. Maybe it's high time we take a look at this formula because maybe the city's not getting its fair share. Maybe it's time the city look at preempting. Maybe it's time for all these things. But the carte block dictate that you're going to take 50% of our second highest source of revenue is just wrong, borderline criminal in my opinion, and is not going to make for harmonious relations. And I don't care what sensitive feelings people want to blame on the mayor and I taking Joe Lightfoot and Kevin Akers to task because we're going to keep taking them to task. Every one of those legislators is up for election this year, and this city better participate in it. You better look at the people that are representing your city right now and ask, are they doing the job? Are they bringing it home for Ogdensburg? Are they fighting for Ogdensburg at the level that needs to be fought for? Because it's not happening right now. The county took our money, and then when we said, fine, we'll preempt, they stood in the way of us getting this home rule legislation. Every person in this city has got to get around the idea that we're preempting. It only makes sense. Ogdensburg will stand on its own two feet. We'll do more than show up. We'll stand on our own two feet. We'll live with the money we make right here. But we got to have our fair share. And the county's been holding on to this 8% too long. It's supposed to be emergency money. It's supposed to be money that they use for a temporary period of time to get well. And they did that. Their sales tax revenues have grown from $25 million to $60 million, And they're still taking the 8% from everybody in the county. When are they going to get off that? Because they're addicted to the 8% now. They'll be lobbying the state legislature to change the law to get 9% soon. We can't be the 8% sales tax county forever. This city has got a hole it needs to dig out of. This city could use some of that emergency money for one, one period of three years. And that's what we need. And this year, Mark Walzik and Patty Ritchie need to find a way to get this legislation passed. Now, the senator got her side pushed through, but we all know it doesn't matter if one side gets pushed through. It takes both. It's an old game being played in Albany for years. Let one go through so it looks like somebody, somebody did good and blame it on the other side. So this year, the rookie took the nut. Mark took the nut in the head. Didn't get it passed. And the senator is the hero. We need them both to be engaged in this. We need them both to make a plan, and we need them both to bring the home rule legislation to Augensburg. We need that 1%. That closes the gap. And hell, it takes us off the county's worry list. We get the same amount of money if we get that, and the county doesn't have to worry about sending it. The county thinks we're a drain on them. We have put forward about 11 different initiatives to St. Lawrence County. Stall, stammer, debate, negotiate, sort of, and then never agree to anything. In a year and a half, we haven't closed the deal on the dispatch. It's just common sense. More than 20 years ago, they got the money to build a consolidated 911 center. They answered the 911 calls. But somehow, Augensburg bought into the idea, of, we'll just keep dialing a seven-digit number. We won't use the 911 center that we all pay for. Now, now it's a 10-digit number, yes, sir. So we all bought into that. We can't afford a 911 center. I won't get a dollar for dispatch. The state and the federal government won't give me a dollar to improve the dispatch center because it's supposed to go to the county for one 911 center. One. They already got it. So the fact that they're refusing now to take their full amount of responsibility is just criminal, and we will see that issue to the end one way or the other. Property tax, 
collection and foreclosure I said earlier, they got us collecting their tax. Why? Because that's the model that's used everywhere else in the county. Every village and town, every town, I'm sorry, collects the property tax for the county by law. It's the law. But it's not the law the city has to do that. Well, we were doing it because it just makes sense. It's efficient. It makes sense to have that program going on. Why aren't they treating us the same? Why aren't they making us whole and taking our delinquent property tax list? Why aren't they taking our foreclosures the way they take every other one? Now their argument is you get more money except they took our money and they want us to have the same money everybody else does. So which is it? You want all of our money, but you don't want to give us the services you give everybody else. You want us to have the money that's the same as the towns and villages get, but you want to keep the level of service that you want to give us. I hope there's room for complex discussion, professional discussion, negotiation. What we experienced in the last year and a half of the county wasn't professional and it wasn't anywhere near negotiation. It typically was a session where Joe Lightfoot and Kevin Akers lectured for an hour or two at a time to the mayor and I about why we didn't need the money. About why I was mad that union contracts were signed they guaranteed three, three and a half percent raises for five, six, and seven years. And then the unions that represent the county employees wanted the same because they saw it in Augsburg. Wow. Sound familiar? I don't think we're on different topics there. But the county's unhappy about that. Don't think Augsburg's using their money right. Why should we give you more of the money if you're just going to squander it on things that you shouldn't be doing? We have to find a way to negotiate with the county in a professional and fair manner. If the senator and the assemblyman want to step up and help, it would be greatly appreciated. There needs to be a mediator that sits down and tells everybody the facts. Us fighting only has us fighting, and it's only going to make things worse. There will be no stomach in Ogdensburg to support the next version of the county wanting 8%. At least I hope there won't be any stomach if they're not going to support us. There will be consequences. Second order effect, third order effect, something else will occur. We'll hit them, they'll hit us, we'll hit them. It'll just keep going back and forth. We've got to find a better way to do business. The mayor and I went to every one of those sessions. Councilor Fisher went to some of those sessions. Our legislators went to those sessions. There was never a negotiation. The only negotiation, quite frankly, was the mayor. Negotiating with himself some days. He would make a proposal that was fair and reasonable. They wouldn't accept it. So to get them to come back to the table, we would reduce our proposal. It was, it was the right thing to do, trying to extend the olive branch, extend the hand. We went with about four different proposals. No proposal was ever good enough. I wish the relationship would not be eroding the way it is. I wish there would not be the public displays of animosity that there are. But we can't function in this professional environment. And we've got to have a change in how we function at the county legislative uh, area. St. Lawrence County Psychiatric Center properties. Again, I want to say these are state of New York properties. The state consumes far too much of our property that they're not using for any active use. We spent too many years in Ogdensburg in silence. Don't criticize the psychiatric center, they'll close. It. Don't say anything about what they're doing or they'll move people out of there. Folks, look around. They've been closing that psych center for the last 20 years. It's a scant picture of itself. So we've not been saying anything, so they didn't close it while the while they're closing it. It's sort of the same way the state holds the status of the prisons over our head. We need those jobs. We need those prisons to stay open. But look what the state is doing. They're reducing the population, reducing the population, reducing the population. Are we just waiting for them to close the facilities before we stand up for ourselves? Or are we just finally going to say enough? We're not going to be bullied around by the state of New York anymore. They own too much of our property not being used, deteriorating, and soon we'll be home to people doing activities that, again, I'll have to have law enforcement chasing in state facilities. It is time. Senator Ritchie led a task force several years ago, but sadly enough, the bureaucracy bogged it down. Six, seven, eight years, something like that. That's just been sitting there. We've had legislation that we would get a piece of land and the bureaucracy couldn't move it forward. 
She's recently re-engaged that effort. I thank her for that. I believe the agencies want to move this forward, but we have to stay diligent on the state of New York. And we have to find a way to do this without spending so much of our money. Councilor Reese has asked for, we have budgeted for money to be able to do the study. I think that it's deplorable. I think that it's ridiculous. And I think it's a complete waste of the city funds to do such. But we don't have a choice because the state's not going to. So only by doing this inventory, doing this property condition survey of all this and getting the information ourselves will we arm ourselves to be able to tell the state of New York, you need to move forward. And again, everybody in this city needs to be behind these initiatives. The state of New York is costing our community thousands. The Ellensburg Bridge and Port Authority, we've had our differences with them. We've also had our successes with them. I believe that we've moved uh, now towards positive relations. We will open the beach in 2022. We assisted them in selling at least one significant property on Route 37. And I hope that we will be able to continue enticing them to be very reasonable, very negotiable, and moving other properties forward. Again, these are properties already owned by the people that are costing the people of this city money because nothing's happening with them. We have to move it forward. We have to move forward without the fear that if we upset the state, they'll do something worse to us. I'm not certain as I look around what the state can do worse to us. I know there'll be plenty of people who say, oh yes, yes, there's things worse they could do to us. I don't know if that's true. I think they might do them anyway, and then we've wasted all this time. The state and the Bridge and Port Authority need to put all their unused properties back in the tax rolls through a public auction process. Yes, sir. The last topic uh, by way of governmental priorities is, as again, as I spoke earlier, we have to look at how we partner with our local fire department resources. We have to look at the model in which emergency services are provided. In much of the same way, we have to look at the law enforcement. The county has to begin to take a look at how we provide fire protection. There is a reason why the bulk of this county, all of this county really, has volunteer fire service. It's very expensive. In 2022, the city will need to begin looking at another model for providing fire protection. I do not believe that we can sustain a fully career fire department at the level that we can. The costs are increasing too much. The resources which we have to draw from are not there. It's not that I think this is a better model. I think it is the reality that we'll face soon. Will we wait until we can only afford two firefighters on duty or one firefighter on duty to look at a different model? Is it really so bad to have some volunteer help or some paid on call initiative help to be able to augment our forces? We will need to look at some of these things. We will need to look at consolidation of local law enforcement. We will need to look at consolidating with the county in healthcare. We need to look at every function of city government and see if there's a better way to do it. We must have the support from our state elected officials. I believe that our federal officials can help and will support us, but it's a much bigger bureaucracy. And right now, a lot of our problems are at the state level. We have to have active involvement. No sitting on the fence. Augsburg's got no place for fence riders. If you're elected to serve this district, you have to be active in this district. You have to be reaching out and seeing the issues that go on in Augsburg and supporting the issues in Augsburg. <coughs> you can't sit idle on issues in Augsburg. You can't do it. And we've got to hold our local, our state officials to that. Council, my final thoughts moving forward for a better Augensburg. We must continue to analyze the past practices. We can't afford to make the same mistakes over and over again. We can't raise taxes. We can't afford to staff people that we can't afford. We can't afford to strip every small program to offset the cost in the larger programs. We've got to accept our present reality. Everyone's got to participate. Minority, majority, one, two, you got to participate. You got to show up. You got to have ideas, you got to show up prepared. We don't have a city that has enough staff to do all the lifting. We don't have it. 
Our employee sheet, those numbers reflect the members of city council. Seven of those numbers are 95 or city councilors. As far as I'm concerned, you're all city employees as well. I need your support, I need your help. One area I can't possibly muscle, and nobody wants to see me muscling, quite honestly. Most of the public has made that clear. I can't muscle the political environment. You, the elected officials, got to muscle the political environment. Every one of you got to pick a project, and you got to run to the house with it. I heard some candidates talking about doing work. I'm not aware of it. If they were doing it, they were doing it without my knowledge and coordination with the staff who has the facts. Is this a budget meeting or political grandstanding? I'm I seriously, the part where we I seriously need council support in doing this. I need every councilor's support in doing this. And the best, the best way we can achieve that is to adopt a community development plan because the budget is a reflection of that. And you need that directive from the city council so that the state and everybody's aware that that's our wishes and our desires. I do, and we need a political action plan, Councilor Reich. We need a political action plan that is led by the political officials of this city, a well-coordinated one-voice policy that is led by the elected officials of this city. We must accelerate the future revival. The citywide reevaluation must occur. We must start it soon. We must approve the money in the budget for that. We can't wait. If our equalization rate drops below 100, we will suffer penalties in all areas, in particular state aid, that we can't afford to lose $1. There is only one way to do citywide evaluations that I'm aware of, and that is to hire a company to come in here and do it from start to finish, the same company with the same standards at the same time, evaluating property values. That's the only way that I'm aware of. It's the way that I proposed, and you'll have proposed contracts from me at the first meeting. The future of Augensburg is not trying to revive the past. We're never going back to the city that we were. Factories, manufacturing. It's going to look different in Augensburg. Things are going to feel different. But we want an Augensburg. I believe that's everybody's goal. Petty arguments about who lives here, where they live, where they go, are not getting it done. Arguing about whether the city attorney comes to a meeting or not is not getting it done. Throwing your concerns about your hurt feelings on social media when you're throwing the jabs out there too and acting like somehow you're a victim of it is not getting it done. It needs to all stop. I 100% agree with that. And I hope it will stop among all elected and appointed officials in the coming year. Council, I thank you for your time. I ask you to strongly consider the budget that the staff has presented to you. We think it's highly efficient. It meets the needs of the city and moves us to the future. Thank you. Thank you. This is some great work you guys have done. We really appreciate it. Is there any other discussion? Yeah, I would like to make a uh, res or motion to table it just because we just received this. Um, we've just been presented with the budget. Previously, we've always had it before this meeting. We've always been given it like the Friday before, so we can actually take the time over the weekend to look at it. Section C61 of the Charter says the City Council, after receiving the City Manager's preliminary budget, shall accept the proposed preliminary budget or make any modification to it as the City Council may desire and on or before the 15th day of November of each year. They shall file the accepted proposed preliminary budget with the City Clerk and the Comptroller of the City of Augsburg. The proposed preliminary budget shall be public record and shall be made available for inspection by the general public at the office of the city clerk. So based on that, I don't see why we can't take the remainder of the week so we can actually acquaint ourselves with it, go over it, bring some more positive things to it till we can get to um, our next meeting on Monday night and then we could just table it until then and vote on it. We have until November 15th and nothing is going to change between now and Monday night if we um, don't table this. Last year we were presented the budget. The budget was late. That was acceptable, and we got the budget late last year. So I believe it's in the city's best interest to have all counselors familiar with the preliminary budget before we just blindly accept something. I'm not comfortable accepting a preliminary budget that I haven't even had the time to look through the pages of it yet. Um, and there's also no public comment on tonight's city council meeting, and I feel as duly elected city counselors, we deserve to hear from the public, and they have no opportunity to do so tonight. Oh, I think there's no harm in accepting it, and we're going to work on it. Oh, I'm sorry, in a second. Bill, second. 
didn't think so. I understand where you're coming but, from. Like, and I, I just and think, I've actually thought about Like, this. I just think that, I honestly think that in order to accept a proposed budget that you haven't even looked at, I mean, I haven't. I don't know if anybody else has seen it before they got here tonight, but I haven't seen this at all. And how in good conscience can you vote on something you haven't even opened? Just because because the point is to accept it to make it available to the public, I think. So I, I thought about this too, Nicole, and I, I, I felt the way you did this afternoon. I got thinking about it. And um, so we're not adopting it. We're accepting it. No, I understand it, so that, but I'm filed. still not comfortable accepting something I haven't looked at. Like, so if I haven't, I'm not going to accept it until I've had the opportunity. That's why I asked last week when we were going to be able to get it because I wanted to be able to be prepared for tonight's meeting. And I don't feel prepared because I wasn't giving it an ample time to look over it. So that's that's the reasoning behind it. I just feel like if we're going to accept something on behalf of the city manager, the comptroller, there's the residents of Ongar, we should at least have had time to look through it, at least to look through the pages and see if there's anything that stands out. So that way we can be prepared for any type of discussion that may come. With your acceptance and the public can look at it. Well, I would like to have a good opportunity to look at it at it too and i know i'm just not comfortable accepting something i haven't even been able to look so at so it doesn't get filed with the clerk until it's been accepted okay. correct and, and really the the process that councillor kennedy is describing is is really just making up a process this this is the way the process works i present you a budget you accept it and, the, and then and then you go to work on it it isn't it is intended to kick the can down the road that much farther it's intended it's to be not, accepted it's, on it's in order to make an educated so. an informed decision and by the charter we have till november 15th so if you want to change that go ahead but this is correctly what we have right now in the charter states november 15th so i would at least like to take a few days to be able to be prepared in order to accept something so if, if obviously i don't have a second whatever that's fine but i'm just making my point clear that i just feel like we just received this tonight there's been no opportunity for public input placed on tonight's agenda because it was a special meeting and chosen not to be put on there so i'm would just like to make the motion to do that. There, I don't want to change no. the issue. We're, we're here. There's no provision in the charter, Mayor. There's no provision in the charter to have public comment or debate on the manager's proposed budget. The idea is you accept the budget as presented by the staff, and then you go to work on it. You you spend every day between now and the next deadline working on it, not pontificating about changing a proposed budget that then you can pontificate afterwards on a final budget. Oh, big word. The the, the, the key word. And the C61 of the acceptance of the preliminary budget is, as you read, the city council, after receiving the city manager's preliminary budget, shall accept the proposed preliminary budget or wait until the 15th if you want to. Again, in here, I read nothing that says that the public at this point, because it has to be released to the public, and this is just a step to get it to the public. I know, but genuinely. And our job here is to. His job is to give us this preliminary budget, which he has done, and our simple acceptance of it is just ex what what we're paying him for, and he's done the job we asked him, regardless of what's in there. I have not read that. I look forward to it. I'd like to thank him for it. I'd like to thank Angela and all city staff that put time into it. Um, I look forward to reading it, and I look forward to going through each one of these sessions, And but throwing the public into it at this point c61 doesn't say anything about the public it's just his job is to give to us it's our job to break it down the public gets to read it then we have input and, and you're entitled to your opinion and no i'm not it no and c61, i 61 it's right there i understand that and i can you, you're the I, one that brought it up no and i i am appreciate your opinion so any other discussion? Are we ready to vote? I think we need to get that word accept out of the charter. Kathy, would you call the roll, please? Councillor Fisher? No. Oh, no, yes. That's how you meant on the. What are we voting on here? There was no second on no, Councillor no, Kennedy's no, motion no, to table. Oh, yeah. Yes, because there was already a motion. Yes. Councillor Kennedy? No. Councillor Reich? This is on accepting the budget? Yep. Yes. That is correct, sir. Mayor Skelly? Yes. Councillor Dillaba? Yes. Approved. At this time, I will make a motion to adjourn. Second. 
second. Um, all, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Adjourned. Thank you.